I am an Anglican priest and I was ordained in 1997 by Archbishop Rowan Williams, who was at that time Archbishop of Wales. When did you know you had a calling to the priesthood? When I was 19. I felt deeply called to priesthood, but of course it was totally impossible in those days in the Anglican Church. And therefore I tried becoming a nun. Uh, I wanted to join a contemplative order, but the, the, I was already a qualified doctor and the men who were in charge of vocations to the religious life uh, were not happy about me going into a contemplative order to pray. Uh, they wanted me in an active order, so I was sent to the community of the Holy Name in Morven Link. I served four and a half years I was sent to Africa. That was a very traumatic time because I asked the order not to recall me too quickly if they had to recall me because in the part of Africa where I was working there was a great deal of schistosomiasis and pregnant women were died because the uterus could not open. No man could attend a woman in childbirth in Liberia where I was working on in the right in the jungle. And because I was doing cesarean sections, I knew that if I left precipitately, these women, when they fell pregnant again, would die. I didn't want that to happen. But they did recall me without notice. And I suppose that that was a turning point. I, I felt I had to go back to medicine. And I went back to medicine. So I came home, um, became a general practitioner in England, and married and had four children. You still, though, felt that you had a calling? Yes, I did. But I was married to an Anglican priest uh, who did not believe in the ordination of women at all. And when I once broached the subject, uh, after um, both he and my parish priest laughed, I then kept silence for 11 years. It was very painful. It was at the end of the 11 years that I felt increasingly called to some ministerial position and I then raised the subject with my husband and by this time he had changed his mind. I think maybe he'd just seen how painful it was for me. Um, and so we began together to look for some way of being a deaconess. Of course we never, we realised the ordination to the priesthood was completely impossible. You said your husband um, may have changed his mind because for 11 years he saw the pain that you were in. How did that pain express itself, do you think? Through continued devotion to the sacraments and through continued uh, steadfast witness and prayer to my Christian faith. And um, and because we were married, we would talk theologically together. He saw no reason for me to go through three years of theological education, because I was by that time very theologically literate, self-taught, but literate. And because we were able to talk at that level with each other, I think he did, he did be begin to respect my views, which I didn't. I kept silent about wanting to be ordained, but I didn't hide my views that religion was intimately connected with peace and with justice towards people. What happened in 1968? Well, in 1968, uh, Lambeth Conference said that uh, there was no theological reason against women. Uh, so I took, I took courage from that, and I was beginning to look for ways of being 
starting to train as a deaconess, which was all I could train as at the time. Deaconesses were lay, they were not ordained. Deaconesses were usually educated full-time uh, in ministry and most of them were single women. I was a married woman. It was very difficult to get accepted to be a deaconess. There was discrimination. Uh, I was not allowed to sleep in residential quarters with the men. I had to commute from London to Bletchingley once a month for a weekend by driving 70 miles down the road from my work, directly from my work as a general practitioner, uh, to, the, to the session, which was mandatory. I turn round at nine o'clock, come home, have a few hours sleep, get up at five, return back down to to um, to Bletchingley where I was in training, uh, come back at nine o'clock at night on Saturday night, go down again for seven o'clock service uh, on Sunday morning. So that was my, the pattern of our lives. Did you ever feel like giving up at that stage? Yes, many times. <laughs> but because they made it so difficult, <laughs> I grew stronger in determination. <laughs> And so we, we, we lasted out. It was very traumatic. So after you were made a deaconess, it didn't stop there. You then went on and became a priest. Um, how many years later was that? I was made deaconess in 1970. My husband died in 1979. I left my work in East Sussex with disadvantaged children and abused children and I went to live in Wales, near a community where I was an oblate, um, the Society of the Sacred Cross, Timar Convent. To work in Wales, I had to become a deacon. So I became a deacon in order to, to, to use my deaconess office in Wales. <laughs> and I thought that was the end of it. By that time, I was a person who was an advocate for women priests, and I was a public advocate. I had been in in the Church of England, and I continued to be a public advocate in the Church in Wales. And because I was a public advocate, it didn't sit well with this community as a as a religious sister, and there was dissension in the community. So in the end, again, I went to live as a solitary because it didn't work out that I could, I could be a contemplative nun and work in a parish. So the vacation to the di diaconate by that time was very strong in me and I, I, I couldn't, I could not, not, I, I was, by that time, I was able to give Holy Communion to the sick and I was able to exercise a diaconal ministry in the church. And when I, uh, when I went to be a nun, I had to give all that up, of course. Uh, and it, uh, they did then consent to me be, becoming a deacon and they gave me six hours a, a week to work in the parish. When I went back to the parish after a year, years away from it, I knew I could not go back if they asked me to go back. And of course they did, and I couldn't go back. Because by that time, I was exercising a pastoral ministry. And then what happened to you? Yeah. I became a solitary. Uh, Archbishop Williams was very kind, and um, he, he allowed me uh, to... Um, I came to the end of my temporary vows. I did not uh, go forward for full vows, but I took vows of celibacy and um, vows of simplicity of life and obedience to a rule of, of prayer and life as a, as a solitary contemplative. I lived in a little house uh, in a churchyard next to the church where I worked. Uh, I had a vicar who was very supportive in theory but in practice found it extremely difficult if somebody said they didn't want my ministry. Um, and I worked there with him for the best part of 11 years, I think it was. And then what happened? There was a, a huge change in your life on the horizon, wasn't the, there? The huge change in my life was when the church in Wales said that it would ordain women. And um, 
1997 age. You see, they had they had they had rejected the idea of women in priesthood when the English women became priests. A lot of the church people in Wales left the church in Wales, went to England. I didn't. I believed that I was made a deacon in the Church of Wales. That was my church. And I was loyal to my church. It wasn't going to ordain women. I would stay and live it out. I did stay. And then three years later, they changed their minds. So I was then uh, made uh, ordained to the priesthood by the Archbishop of Wales. So Una, your life up till that point had been one of patience, of of putting up with discrimination with great grace. And then you made the most extraordinary decision to having struggled to get this far to <laughs> become a Catholic. Yes, I did make an extraordinary decision. I was 13 years a priest. I was very happy as a priest. I loved it. And although it was, uh, there was a lot of discrimination still, which was gradually being eroded by the, my fellow women priests. Of course, they were women priests in England. I left Wales in 2003 uh, to come and live nearer my family because I was getting older. And I also was crippled with arthritis in one leg. And I was very unwell at the time. So I left on medical grounds and because I think I was being becoming broken by the discrimination. Your trip to Mount St Bernard was a trip which yielded great fruits, but probably through some pain. I found it very hard to give up the priesthood of the church, to, to, to stop being active as a priest in the Anglican Church. I went to Mount St Bernard on retreat in order to ask God to show me what that meant. And while I was at St Bernard in the, in the very early morning, in the church, I remembered the women who had stood, the Catholic women who had come to my ordination, and at my ordination had said to me outside, do not forget us, you know, and I said, I will never forget you. I never had forgotten the Catholic women who longed for a fuller life in, the, in their own church and I wanted to support them and while I was in St Bernard I got a very strong uh, intimation the only way I could do that was by joining them in their oppressed state and I did that and I told the Anglican priest who said what do you want to join a church like that for um, which rejects women and I said precisely because they reject women I just long to see the Catholic Church embracing women and all the gifts that they have. So I work towards that by living, praying, witnessing in the Catholic Church to the goodness of women. And you truly believe that this is what God wants for the church. Oh, yes, I truly believe that. Yes, I believe that they are called to be women priests. And I believe that they should be fully part of the church's ministry. You asked me whether I was optimistic that the views I hold might prevail one day. Yes, I do. Not not in the immediate future, nor maybe in the long-term future. I think the church has got to be reformed and renewed and that the hierarchical governance of the church needs reform. I've had my eyes fixed on the light at the end of dark places so that I have a picture in my room which is of overhanging trees and a very dark tunnel uh, through which you can see light at the end of it, and at the end of it there's a gate. The gate is a barrier, but that gate for me one day will open and will admit women and will benefit by admitting women to the ordained ministry and will rejoice.
both in the Anglican Church and in the Catholic Church. But the day that that will happen is in God's hands and not in ours.